Hi, this is Scott Bradfield. This is the summer 2017 edition of the Hunger Games. It's part two. Um, it was a, I, I'm almost about to give up on the Hunger Games. They're just because there's just too many pacifists in my group. I mean, uh, um, so uh, but we have a lecture topic, which uh, I think was one is one I just want to talk a little bit about. These are very informal lectures, and that is about uh, what what do politics have to do with the fiction we enjoy reading. Again, I always go back to this. The first, your first thing as a writer is reading. Most of my students, this is the part I have the most trouble with. Reading is how you learn to write, and reading good writers. And uh, how do politics have? What do they have to do with what you write? Now, reading around, you, you start to realize a few things, and they may not be the things you want to hear. Politics has nothing to do with what we like to read. If politics, if a good fiction writer knows how to do certain things to keep us interested. They present the world they see and their characters see. Again, very, very important to notice how often good writers can write from the viewpoint of characters they don't like. So they may often not, enjoy, not like the person that they're writing about, but they see the world through their eyes. And that's one of the great gifts of being a writer. So good, uh, being a good writer. So, for example, um, let me go through a few, I put a few books here on the shelves just to talk about, and I want to finish with point blank. Let's look at one of the great, you know, I mean, one of the great political writers of the past century, which is Orwell. Orwell wrote enormously, um, wonderful essays. He was a great prose writer. He wrote beautiful essays and a number of books, such as Road to Wigan Pier, which were political and social critiques of his period, which are still worth reading today. They're so beautifully put together. Uh, Down and Out in Paris and London is a great picture of what it's like to do crappy work at, at the time when Orwell was doing terrible jobs. And there, he was, he's a great reporter and experiencer of the world that particularly working people are going are living in in, in, uh, in in Europe in the 20s and 30s. Now, he was not a great novelist. I'm, I'm going to say this quite strongly. Books like 1984, they're taught in all our high schools because it's a, it's a politically and intellectually strong vision of how, totalitari how, totalitari how totalitarianism operates. It's easy to say. And it is very canny in the way it represents the similarities between, say, Russian... Russian repression of the, of the masses and the Western repression and how propaganda works in some places and how power works in others. Now brainwashing and techniques of brainwashing. It, it, there's, there's some wonderful stuff in it. It's not a successful novel. I think there's some beautiful prose in it, but I've never considered Orwell a great novelist in the same way that this is another book, Animal Farm, which is taught often to teenagers, you know, because it, it, it's a good way of talking about Stalinism, say. Um, and again, I, it, it is so controlled in order to present a, a picture of a certain political reality that even though his, his prose is very very good, almost every sentence in Orwell, he was never considered a particularly good novelist by other novelists. And if it weren't for his, his political eye, I don't think his books would be read today. Now, um, let's think about some other writers who may be less palatable to us. Excuse me from sticking my face in here. Here's a good example of a writer who politically you may not like. I don't like his politics, okay? But I can't fault his prose and his narrative abilities, particularly in his late books. His late books are his best books, Updike. And Rabbit at Rest is a particularly good example of how someone who writes from a political perspective, which is fairly conservative, it's often bigoted, it's considered sexist, it's considered, um, you know, very, you know, he was, he was, a, he was a Vietnam supporter, he supported things like Vietnam, and his politics were incredibly uh, awful. Every time he's opened his mouth about politics as a man, he was horrible. But he created one of the great, creepy, uh, kind of great characters in literature, which is Rabbit, particularly in the last two books. Rabbit is a right-wing guy who would probably voted for Trump. <laughs> I can see him voting for Trump. 
and he's kind of an awful man. But his the novels are presented as a picture of Rabbit's vision of America. And you see America through his eyes, and you find yourself agreeing with him a lot of the time, even though you might not want to vote for Trump. He does bring out that vision of America from a frustrated working class character who's sick of all these immigrants coming in and ruining his country. And there's the bigotry and the sexism and the selfishness of, of Rabbit are all there. But as a piece of novel writing, it's a really powerful piece of prose writing. And, and because he can do all those things so well, you still read him. Here's another good example. Evelyn Waugh. Now, Waugh was another person who was a real right-wing Tory reactionary. His visions of, of working class people, black people, and almost everybody, not just, uh, not just minorities or women, all his characters are pretty horrible. And he sees democracy as a, as a kind of uh, victory of the horrible people over the other horrible people, which are probably the aristocratic characters who he likes to pal around with. And his vision of the world is not pleasant, but it's impossible to read Waugh without seeing one of the great technical writers. He's hilarious. He's funny. He keeps you absorbed. You probably don't end up liking any of his characters at the end of one of his books. But he's incredibly funny, and he's a, you, can't, you can only learn from him. Now let's look at a writer whose politics I, I quite like. Graham Greene was an old leftist. He learns enormously from Waugh. You can almost see page by page Greene, who was a great reader. All you, all you wanted, people want to be writers. He was a great reader, Greene. He wrote well about other writers. He wrote well about the writers he loved, and he wrote, he read widely. He just didn't read, you know, leftists like himself. He, he read everyone, particularly people like Wall or P.G. Woodhouse, or people who were considered politically offensive to the right on characters of his generation. Orwell was another person who was very appreciative of good writers, okay, whatever their politics. And here's, here's a Green novel, one of my favorites, The Human Factor, which is one of the, is, Probably the only book that came out that was quite sympathetic to the Philby types of the world, the people who were considered traitors to their cause. I wanted to, uh, traitors to the West and traitors to uh, America versus the Russians and all this crap. Okay, I want to close with just a few more things to say. Again, what writers who have the technical ability to tell a story, who have a vision of the world, and who can present characters who see the world in a certain way are the ones we want to read. We don't care if, if you if you're looking around for the books that that represent your political view of the world, you're probably not going to be a, ever learn how to write. This is also why a lot of people who consider the sort of the right on political writers, people who say things well and who who represent things the way people should think, are not often very good writers. They're not often very good people who who become celebrated because you know they they represent a certain political position well. It's it's not always a good sign. Right. Let's look at a, a kind of a schlock writer here. The writer we're reading this term, and I'll hopefully read again, which is, this is the original version, the first paperback edition of The Hunter, Richard Stark, also known as Donald E. Westlake. And it was made a film into a film called Point Blank. And this is, just so you can see it, my signed edition when I met Donald E. Westlake. There you go. I signed a desk when I, met, I interviewed him in like 1990 when, when his books were coming out in England in hardcover. Now, let's, let's think real briefly here about a man who wrote basically paperback thrillers. Now, you wouldn't think of these as political novels. But at the same time, Donnelly Westlake had a vision of America, which is extremely political. Uh, he, he sees, uh, unlike a lot of thriller writers who often racialize everything, you always, you often have like, you know, even Elmer Leonard, you know, it's always kind of poor blacks, poor Hispanics. You, you see a lot of, a lot of, uh, of racial uh, identity in a lot of thriller writers, even The Wire, stuff like this. This is one of the most interesting writers to me because uh, Dolly Westlake and Richard Stark really see evil in the world, not in racial terms. <laughs> they see evil in the world as almost entirely white people. 
like you remember Michael Moore's book, Stupid White People? Almost all of them are stupid, violent white people. The, 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 the organization, all the criminal organizations are a bunch of white middle class guys who work in offices. And, and, and if, for example, you've got your, all your characters in here, the Carters and, the, and uh, the Fairfaxes, they all have these kind of very middle of class white guy names. And that's very consistent throughout uh, Westlake's career. He doesn't write books to say, our danger in our world is the corporations run by white guys, white men. He just never says that. But all of his books are set in that landscape, set in that world of Carters and Fairfaxes who are sitting in their nice air-conditioned offices sending people out to kill other people and steal their money. And that is a, a very strong political vision of the world, which, which isn't the reason Westlake writes his books. He writes the thrillers quickly for money and for, to entertain himself, but he sets in the world he recognizes. And that's really your one job as a writer, not to speak the political lingo that you think will be acceptable, because your readers don't care ultimately. They'll read you if you write about some kind of horrible old guy um, like Rabbit, or you have a completely anti-humane vision of the world, and you're a good writer, just as much as if you are um, a writer who maybe politically is different from that. So your ultimate job has nothing to do with politics. Politics has nothing to do with good fiction, uh, ultimately. And your first job is to learn the basics. Okay, thanks. I uh, hope that was at least gave you some ideas of some books to read, if nothing else.